So, uh, I, I will talk indeed about K3 surfaces, but I will try to also connect some of the things that I say with other topics that relate to Riemann surfaces and uh, Teichmuller spaces and uh, dynamics, which is uh, in some form the, the topic of the school. So, I, I will, w the, the range of topics that I'll cover will be, I think, quite uh, diverse. So, we'll, we'll see different ingredients coming together. And hopefully, uh, you know, depending on your uh, preferences, you, you will like at least some parts or and will ask questions about the others. So uh, b before uh, I tell you what K3 surfaces are, I, I want to try to explain what is the difference between a Riemann surface and a, a complex surface. So a complex surface is a, in particular a, a real four manifold. But uh, I want to remind you just the classification of Riemann surfaces. So. So when you talk about Riemann surfaces, you ha we I will always consider only compact genus G, and there are essentially three possibilities. If you have genus zero, there is essentially one Riemann surface uh, of genus zero, which is compact. Yeah. So that's uh, the line. The, the complex line with a point at infinity. When the genus is equal to one, you have elliptic curves. And in particular, so the, these are, one way to represent them is as the complex plane modular lattice. And when G is equal to two, at least two, then you in some sense have the general case uh, and perhaps it will be unfair to say that there's no difference between genus 2 and genus 3. But for the most part, except for some low genus, whether genus is 5 or 100 doesn't really play such a big role. So uh, this is the... And, and these Riemann surfaces are in particular hyperbolic. So they carry a unique conformal metric of... Uh, Curvature minus one, and so, okay. So maybe I'll just write h two mod gamma to, to repeat what I just said. Uh, th there's one very special thing that happens for Riemann surfaces, which you don't have in general, which is that uh, in the setting, whenever you have a compact Riemann surface, uh, you have a property, which is that all compact Riemann surfaces. Are, is this, can everybody read if I write here? Yeah. yeah? Okay. So all compact Riemann surfaces are algebraic, which means that they can be also represented as algebraic curves, meaning that uh, there's some, for example, projective three space, and you can impose some equations, and you'll get a curve in that three space, and that will equal for any hyperbolic or uh, Riemann surface or elliptic curve, you can obtain it by imposing some polynomial equations in some projective three space, for example. Uh, and it turns out that for co complex surfaces, so when you talk about complex surfaces, which I'm always going to assume that they're compact, complex, two dimensional. Uh, this last fact is no longer true with just these assumptions, and uh, in these lectures we'll mostly be interested in uh, algebraic surfaces, so surfaces which you can also obtain by imposing polynomial equations in some uh, projective space, but uh, oftentimes the non-algebraic ones, ones which are, uh, appear by some transcendental construction, they're also very important. Uh, and it turns out that there's a similar classification. It's a little bit longer, but essentially you should think of having uh, three cases. And so there's a classification that's called the Enriquez Kodaira. And so Enriquez is for the algebraic ones, and Kodaira also did the 
non-algebraic ones. And just for simplicity, I'll just tell you what the algebraic K3 uh, surfaces are. Uh, and yes, is there a question? And just one remark. Uh, in general, so I will assume always, so to be precise, I'll assume that my surface is minimal, whatever that means, and I'll discuss this, uh, you know, the relevant concept in, in, in a second. But uh, there's a key invariant, which is not quite like the genus. It's more or less in some sense like log of the genus, in fact. Uh, but b before I define this invariant, so what, uh, you know, what distinguishes these three cases fundamentally for uh, among Riemann surfaces? So here you have a differential geometric characterization. Here you have a metric of curvature plus one, curvature zero, and curvature minus one. But how would you characterize these three cases in terms of differential geometry or holomorphic geometry or algebraic geometry? So what distinguishes these three cases? Sorry? You can say it. Yeah, well, our number that, that that's good, but uh, as you go up the dimension, there uh, th there are more uh, you know invariants like that. So you would like one basic invariant, which will tell you which kind of range you're in. Yeah. So, so to say it in, in uh, kind of more concrete terms, so the degree of the canonical bundle is essentially the same as the Euler number. So it's not that different. But th there's one geometric fact, which is that. There are no holomorphic differentials in the Riemann sphere, Holomor uh, holomorphic one forms. There are a lot of vector fields, holomorphic vector fields, but there are no holomorphic one forms. Here, on every elliptic curve, there's essentially exactly one holomorphic one form. And on a hyperbolic surface, there are more. There are many holomorphic one forms. So uh, for complex surfaces, you have a similar kind of invariant. So k is called the Kodaira dimension. and it is something like, as, like the following. So the problem is that, in general, when you go to surfaces, to complex surfaces, uh, there might not be any one forms, but you want to try to define uh, you know, tensor powers of the holomorphic one form. So you, want, so you, you take kx to be the cano uh, this is canonical bundle, and k is the growth rate. So it tells you how fast the holomorphic differentials grow when you try to take higher and higher sections. So it's just the following. So it's length soup over n of log uh, x to the n. So divided by log n. So if you consider how many uh, holomorphic sections does this line bundle have, as n grows, you expect some polynomial in n. And uh, this construction says that the degree of that polynomial is this kappa, right? So uh, I'm introducing this just for vocabulary, just so that you have some idea of where it will be placed. This is not going to play a role later on. But uh, I want to just emphasize two things. So what, what are the possibilities for a log of a number? <laughs> well, it can be, so, yeah? What's that number, H? H zero, so very good. So H zero is, uh, the dimension of capital H zero of x k x to the n. So this is a group, and this is the rank of this group. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So, so to, go, to go back to the question, what's the what are the possibilities for log of a number? If the number is zero, the log is minus infinity. If the number is one, the log is zero, and then it can be positive, right? So. The possibility is in this case, so when, when you have 0, so you have k equals minus infinity, kappa equals ma minus infinity, then you have essentially what are called rational surfaces, which essentially means uh, that they're rational to P2. And you also have what are called ruled surfaces, which are uh, P1 bundles over a curve C. So from now on, curve will mean uh, Riemann surface, and surface will mean complex two dimensional surface, at least uh, if it's not clear from the context that I actually mean a loop. 
Okay, so so, uh, so, so these are uh, the possibilities for w which are kind of the analogs of uh, the Riemann sphere. Uh, when you have k equals zero, uh, well, you can have two ri, you can have k three surfaces, uh, which are so two ri are you know relatively well understood from from the point of view of the questions that I, I want to discuss in these lectures. They are understood in all dimensions. K3 surfaces will be the subject of this lecture, these lectures, and they're also Enrique's surfaces. So these are K3 divided by an evolution, uh, and there's something else. Uh, yeah, so there, there's something else called bioelliptic, uh, meaning that uh, they're a, a bundle of elliptic curves over an elliptic curve, but that, that's not so important. So uh, w what I want to emphasize is that uh, dynamics, so interesting dynamics can only happen in this range. So uh, once you go beyond kappa equals one, uh, kappa equals zero, you know, you know that the hyperbolic Riemann surface does not have any holomorphic automorphisms. So it, uh, it, the, the group of symmetries is finite. It cannot be infinite. and uh, the same uh, thing will happen here. So there's no interesting dynamics after these two uh, cases. So, but just for uh, to finish the list, and so you don't complain that I didn't give you, you know, the full truth. So there, there's all. So uh, there's, there's something called the properly elliptic surfaces, which are. Uh, essentially bundles like this. So they're uh, x maps to c. So c is a curve and uh, with fibers, with general fibers, elliptic curves. And then th there's the same situation as for Riemann surfaces because you say kappa equals 2 and you, it's just general type. And there's nothing useful you can say in general about uh, well there's many there are many things you can say but understanding the surfaces of general type is still very uh, much uh, going on so I, I want to maybe make one remark so why is it that k3 surfaces are uh, more in some of the more interesting and accessible objects in, in this uh, list so if you look at this list there's one word besides surfaces that appears frequently Elliptic, why? right. So elliptic curves are quite important for understanding, uh, and well, and P1 bundles, of course, are quite important for understanding surfaces, right? So the, the previous case, in the previous dimension, knowing the kind of middle level of the classification plays a pretty important role in trying to understand the next level uh, uh, classification. So for, for this reason, K3 surfaces are also quite important in trying to understand three manifolds, complex three manifolds. But uh, for these lectures, we'll, we'll only talk about uh, complex surfaces. OK, so I, I wanted to give you this list just to, uh, so that uh, we have an idea of where, where we are and why K3 surfaces are an interesting uh, concept. Yes? It means that they're bounded, essentially. They don't grow. So th th eventually... Uh, well, they could grow at some slow rate. No, so, so in fact, it's known that they... I mean, that a priori, it's known that this sequence can grow at... at uh, it grows like a polynomial. Uh, and the question is... The only question is, what is the degree of that polynomial? So, uh, you know, it's not a any sequence. So there, there's a further constraint from the fact that it comes from... Uh, a line bundle like this. So it, it can only grow polynomial, and the question is what the degree is. OK. So uh, l let me also just make one remark. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe I can email the organizers. Oh, there's another question. Yes? So you said the interesting dynamics are in the first cases, yeah. or the accessible dynamics are in the first cases? Uh, no, by interesting, I mean homomorphic, uh, in the sense that you can write, uh, th th there's a map, I mean, 
yeah, the, on any manifold, there's dynamics. But if you want it to be holomorphic, then you have to be in the first two cases. Does that clarify it? Or? So could you mean the nat T be curved? Yes. And, and um, so you're saying that the dynamics are? So what I'm saying is that on the hyperbolic Riemann surface, the automorphism group is finite. So you cannot have an infinite order automorphism of a hyperbolic surface. So you might think that this is in contradiction with everything you learned last week about the mapping class group. But uh, the mapping class group never acts holomorphically. It acts by homeomorphisms. And uh, f f so for, 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 the, for the purposes of these lectures, I'm interested in holomorphic maps. And so you're looking at the dynamics of a map, which is applied repeatedly and which is holomorphic? Yes. And in that case, we have to restrict to these. And in the Riemann surface case, in fact, you have to restrict all the way here. OK. I don't think mapping class group does act by homomorphisms. Sorry? I don't think it acts by homomorphisms. Who? Oh, the mapping class group itself, no. But individual elements do, yes. That, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, all right, uh, so, so, so uh, l let me just say, yeah, so th th there's a, actually a very nice uh, reference for, uh, for this, so, so for th thinking about the questions that relate to Riemann surfaces and complex surfaces, and there's a letter, so there's a letter by Andrea Vey, which is called Letter on, or Final Letter on Contract AF. 18603, 57. This was written in 1958, uh, where he uh, talks about K3 surfaces. So in fact, K3 surfaces were named by Andreve in honor of the mountain K2 and Kumar, Kaler, and Kodaira. And so uh, if you, uh, maybe I'll, I can email the organizer as a scan of this. It, it, it's only five or six pages, and it actually explains quite nicely some of the reasons behind the questions about K3 surfaces and how to questions about Teichmuller spaces. Okay? All right. So uh, now I can uh, start telling you about K3 surfaces themselves and wh wh what are they and what are some examples. So. So the definition is that so x is going to be a compact complex to dimensional manifold. So it's going to be a K3 surface if uh, two conditions happen. One is that there exists a nowhere vanishing holomorphic two-form. Uh, which I'll denote most of the time by capital Omega. So it's saying that, uh, so maybe uh, a different way to, to say the same condition is that we're, we're working with a holomorphic symplectic manifold. Or in this case, surface. So in local coordinates, you can always arrange that this Omega looks like just DZ1 wedge DZ2, and it never vanishes. And if you just impose this condition, then you could also be a torus. And, uh, and, and another uh, condition that you have to impose to not have tori is that the fundamental group of x is trivial. And their variants, which are, so this is the strongest conclusion, but in fact, a weaker assumption will give you the same conclusion. And equivalent uh, conditions are that the first Betty number is 0 or uh, if you prefer in terms of sheaf cohomology, there's also this expression which generalizes to, for example, uh, characteristic P, but you probably don't want to know about this. Which one? Uh, so the, the, the so K3 surfaces are simply connected. Enrique surfaces, I think, will have Z mod 2 fundamental group. Yes. So, 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 so what is the question? 
Oh, uh, uh, or yeah, uh, you mean d1 of x? Is that? Okay, so so, uh, so maybe should I write it like h1 of x z is zero? I'm just worried that the satisfies this. Which one? This? this? Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. The, the homomorphic form will not descend. That's right, because it yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, all right. So so this is the definition. Um, and so so what what are some examples? So once we uh, get to dynamics, I'll give more examples. But uh, for, for now, I just want to. Uh, say that you can take a quartic surface in P3, by which I mean you take a degree 4 uh, so equation, so the degree of f in each of the variables uh, is 4. And you notice that there are four variables. And the, uh, another example which plays an important role in many arguments are, is what are called Kummer examples. And Kummer examples are the following. So you start with a torus, T, and you define it to be C2 mod a lattice, lambda. And you quotient by an evolution. Which so this is a group so you can send x to minus x so this is uh, going to ha so the involution on the torus sending x to minus x will have how many fixed points? This is, some people are whispering sixteen. So so that's true. So there will be sixteen fixed points and they will be singular. So what you have to do is you have to uh, blow up uh, the singularities uh, and you, you'll get x, which is going to be a K three surface. And to check that it is a K3 surface, you have to check that uh, these two conditions, and you have to verify that the holomorphic two-form that exists on the torus will survive this process. If you compute, for example, the Betty numbers, you, you'll see that this x has no first Betty number, so vanishing first Betty number. OK, so uh, maybe since uh, this is supposed to be instructive, I, I, I want to say something about blow-ups. So what what are blow-ups, if, if you haven't seen them? So I'll, I'll just give you a formula. And uh, in order to understand how this formula works, I'll give you an exercise to try to uh, do something. But since people tend to think that blow-ups are something that occurs in algebraic geometry, I'll try to give you an exercise which I think is quite compelling, but coming from analysis. So uh, the blow-up uh, at 0 of the line uh, the plane is just defined by the following formula. Uh, so it sits inside a2 cross p1. And if you have coordinates here, x, y, and here homogeneous coordinates, x, s, t, then uh, the equation of the blob is that x over y is equal to s over t, or x, t equals y, s. The picture of a blob is the following. You have the plane, and here is 0. And what you want to do is you want to remove the origin and put in a whole closed line, which is going to be naturally identified with the line of directions going through this point. So when you blow it up, there will be an exceptional line, E. And uh, it will map to 0. Everything else will map bijectively to the outside. And if you have color. Have a line that goes this way. Oops. It goes this way. It will lift to something here. And if you have a line that goes this way, it will lift to something here. So, so that's uh, kind of purely formulaic. But what? Uh, so what, what's the exercise? So the exercise is the following. So you can consider integrals of the form, the integral of f of x y to the power minus s d all. So uh, over the ball of radius 1, 
And so uh, the case I'm interested in is a function that's vanishing somewhere in the plane, and we want to see the order of vanishing. So we're, we're going to take, we're going to be interested in the supremum over S such that this integral is less than plus infinity. And so what you have to do is you have to compute this uh, for two kinds of functions. So if f were, for example, determining a smooth curve in the plane, so here is 0, then uh, hopefully you know how to compute the order of divergence of this integral. Right? Is, is that? Sorry? B1, yeah, so B1, uh, absolute value of yes, x squared plus y squared less than 1, the ball of radius 1. Uh, so if you have a curve like this, so if f, so if the f equals 0, well, if f is not vanishing in the ball, then there's no problem with this integral. Uh, but if f is vanishing, then uh, there's a problem and you're interested in what happens and so first you should try to do y equals x to the a y to the b let's say a and b in just reals and then try to do it for f of x y equals y squared minus x cubed so the vanishing locus of this looks something like this and you cannot choose uh, nice coordinates such that this looks like a smooth curve. And also, the coordinates are a little bit entangled. So the best way to do it is to do some successive blobs and check what happens with this integral and uh, try to compute when does this thing diverge for which values of s. OK, so if, if you haven't seen blobs, this is a good uh, kind of way to get some practice to understand what, what kind of goal they're achieving. OK. So I'll, I'll bring down the board. Is there, are there any questions regarding what? Yeah? Why, why the quartic surfaces are in the surfaces? All right. So uh, uh, I, I was going to say, uh, give another exercise which uh, explains this. But uh, there are two things you need to check, right? The first one is that, well, the second one is that you have some vanishing like this, which follows from some general properties of these quartic surfaces, which is called so they have the same fundamental group as P3. And P3 does not have a fundamental group. So th this is why this is satisfied. And I'll explain in a moment why uh, you have a holomorphic two-form. So in fact, if somebody gives you a polynomial, you can write down explicitly the holomorphic two-form. And I'll tell you in a moment how to, to do that. Yes? Holomorphic. Two forms? Yeah, yeah but, uh, but one thing is that they, if they, they might start vanishing if you blow up. Uh, but because you also had this quotient, somehow the quotient and the blow up annihilate each other and actually have a nowhere vanishing two form. So to, to answer Vincent's question, why is it that on a um, quartic surface you have a holomorphic two-form, and if somebody gives you a quartic surface, how do you write it out? Uh, the answer is what are called residues. So you probably know about residues from holomorphic, uh, you know, from complex one uh, analysis in one variable, where you can compute integrals of functions which have poles. And it turns out that this generalizes to higher dimensions to give uh, holomorphic forms on uh, on, on, the, on the manifold. So the situation is this. So you have, uh, let me call M, complex and manifold, and X inside M complex and minus one manifold and let's say that you have omega is a neuromorphic n form on x with pole 
uh, poles along, sorry, on M, my, my apologies, on M with poles along X, and then you have to check is that, so this is the exercise part, that using the usual residue construction from complex analysis, uh, the residue along x of omega is, is a well-defined holomorphic uh, n minus 1 form on x. And using this, you can check with expli quite explicitly. Uh, so you can verify that uh, a quartic surface in P3 admits uh, nowhere vanishing holomorphic two form. So uh, if you look on P3, there are no holomorphic uh, three forms. However, uh, they'll necessarily have poles. They'll be meromorphic. And the poles will be exactly along some quartic surface. Okay, And when you take the residue of that meromorphic form on P3, you will get uh, a holomorphic form on the quartic surface. Okay, And it's a nice exercise to do. Maybe as a warm-up case, you can try to do it for cubic curves in P2, so for elliptic curves on P2. So uh, you can do the same for cubics, which you know you know that cubic curves in P2 are 2 Ri. OK. Yeah? Uh, sorry? Um, is omega supposed to be like constant valued at infinity along x squared? What does poles along x mean? So it means that if you write it in local coordinates, yeah. where x is cut out by the equation. So you know, let me just write this. So, so locally, so this is a local. So locally, if x is equal to z1 equals 0, so it, it's a smooth manifold, so it's cut out by an equation, uh, omega is equal to f times uh, dz1, where it's da, 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 where it's dzn, and it's allowed to have some z1 to the k. OK? And the, for the residue, you only care about the term which will come out. So f will have some vanishing and so on. Uh, the term when, you know, if z1, k was 1. So this is the only thing that contributes to the residue. But th this is what I mean by meromorphic n form on m with poles along this. OK? So, so the thing to check is that you see f is a function of n variables. And you want to make sure that what you get does not somehow remember that information. OK. Uh, any other questions so far? So uh, now I, I want to tell you a few things about uh, the uh, topology of key 3 surfaces. And then uh, we'll talk about the more analytic aspects of this. So, so the first fact, which uh, is maybe a little bit surprising, is that all K3s are uh, diffeomorphic, in fact. So uh, not just homeomorphic, but diffeomorphic. It turns out that there are complex surfaces which are homeomorphic, but not diffeomorphic. So the differential topology of four manifolds is uh, already more tricky than for surfaces. Uh, in particular, we can talk about that topology as opposed to uh, many different topologies. And uh, we know that H0, so the cohomology, so H4 of x is equal to z. And by Poincaré duality, h1 is equal to h3 is equal to 0. So the only interesting group is the middle cohomology, which is h2. So h2 of x z. Uh, so again, in comparison with Riemann surfaces, when you took the middle cohomology of Riemann surfaces, you got a symplectic pairing. 
And here you have uh, a quadratic form. So, so this has a cup product, uh, which is, in this case, a symmetric bilinear form. And uh, so what, what are the facts about H2? The rest H2 of xz is 22. So this cup product uh, has, when you uh, extend scalars to the reals, this has a signature, right? It's a real uh, cup product. So it has signature So for the cup product. This has signature. Uh, 319, and uh, it is unimodular. So w what does it mean that it's unimodular? Uh, it means that, so if you think about this group, the cup product introduces a volume form, and the integral structure introduces another volume form. And being unimodular, unimodular means that the two volume forms agree. In other words, if you take a Z basis and you write of this group, and you write the matrix of inner products, you have a matrix of determinant one. So it's unimodular, and it's also even uh, e, uh, x times x is in 2z for any x in h2 of double x. So the square of any element is a po an even number. And it turns out that uh, such lattices are, in fact, uh, uniquely determined. So let me just make a small digression on lattices. So what's a lattice for, 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 for this discussion? It's uh, so a free z module lambda, so just z to some power, but not trivialized in some particular k way. Uh, with symmetric bilinear form lambda, lambda to z. And so I already told you what even means. I told you what unimodular means. It has a signature. So it turns out that so, so if it has signature mn and m and are bigger or equal to 1, uh, and if it is even plus unimodular, then it turns out that there is a, a very nice answer, meaning that uh, it is unique uh, up to isomorphism, and so up to highly non-unique isomorphism. So if you have this uh, integer structure with this symmetric bilinear form. It, has many, it can have many automorphisms, but the isomorphism class is essentially just one. And moreover, uh, m is uh, minus, so m is congruent to n mod 8, which you can see is verified in this uh, situation. So it turns out that if you uh, drop, uh, if you have a positive defi a definite lattice, so if one of these numbers vanishes, then the classification of even in modular lattices is much harder. There are finitely many, but they can grow in number. And in general, the understanding of these uh, lattices with different conditions, uh, for example, you can drop unimodular when life becomes a lot harder. Uh, th this classification is very important for the topology of four manifolds. Just like you wanted to understand symplectic pairings for surfaces, uh, for uh, Four manifolds, you need to understand these kinds of uh, la this lattice structure. So, as I said, it, it's unique up to isomorphism, so there should be a way to describe it. And there are uh, two examples, two building blocks, which by this theorem, so this is, I guess, a theorem, uh, 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 there are two building blocks which show that by this theorem you can realize any such lattice from these building blocks. And the examples are, uh, so one is called U. So the matrix of inner products in a Z basis is this. And this is sometimes called the hyperbolic plane. And there's something called the E8 lattice. So this 
So this comes from the root system of Y8. And uh, this is a eight by, essentially it's the data of an eight by eight matrix. Uh, so what does even say? What does, even says that the, this matrix has even entries along the diagonal. So it's a symmetric matrix and being even means that the diagonal entries are even and unimodular means that the determinant of that matrix is one. So you can see that there's a non-trivial constraint to have even numbers on the diagonal and still have determinant one. In any case, uh, such a special object exists. So then uh, this lattice that we're interested in, this K3 lattice, uh, has signature 319 and it's isomorphic in a highly non-unique way, but uh, nevertheless, to three copies of the hyperbolic plane. This has signature 1, 1, and this is positive definite. And then, so you have to take minus E8 uh, twice. So this contributes signature 3, 3, and this contributes signature 0, 16. So together they add up to signature 3, 19. Yeah? Uh, I, I don't think so. So what, what, which one would you like to have? So it's supposed to be symmetric. The determinant is supposed to be uh, what? Plus one? A unit. Plus. A unit. Uh, it's a unit. Yeah, plus or minus. Yeah, I guess unimodular is plus or minus one. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I guess I want to write in symmetric form. Yeah. So, so unimodular, yes. So to correct, unimodular means determinant plus or minus one. OK, uh, other questions about this so far? So E8 is a certain lattice. It's this data, which I will not write uh, explicitly. But there's a way to read it off from th this famous E8 diagram. So let's see. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, no, this. So there's a way to extract from this diagram an 8 by 8 matrix, which will have twos on the diagonal, and which will have determinant plus or minus 1. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it's some very specific object, which uh, writing it out explicitly will not, uh, I think, illuminate its nature. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a separate story in some sense. Yeah? I feel like Oh, okay, yeah, it didn't seem it seemed a little bit too close. Okay. And what's its signature? Uh, it's positive definite. So, so it's typically it's taken to be positive definite, so this is why I put a, a minus so that it's strictly negative definite. And it's dimension 8. Sorry. So, why, why do I think it's required to turn two? Sorry? Why the rank of the column is required to turn two? Uh, so so that, that, that's a computation that uh, comes, for example, so you can compute it for the quartic surface. There are some ways to compute the rank of this group from some, uh, for, I mean, yeah, formulas more or less about Chern classes and things like this. So, so okay, so, so maybe the, the easiest way to say it is that I think it's non, it is reasonable to compute the Euler characteristic of the quartic surface. And from knowing the Euler characteristic plus the vanishing of all the other groups, it tells you what the rank is. Okay, and knowing that it's even, it's another, it's a, it's a computation which is Whitney classes, and uh, you can check that. Uh, so it's a separate again discussion. And then uh, signature three nineteen will become apparent in a moment why that happens. Okay. Uh, are there other questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, so the theorem says that yes, if it's even and unimodular, anybody who has such a lattice uh, is even and unimodular and indefinite. So it's important for it to be indefinite, to have, sign uh, to have, to not be def to have signature, non-trivial non signature, then such a lattice isomorphism is unique and in fact has further constraints. Okay? All right, yeah. Other questions so far? No. So let me uh, now move on to the kind of more analytical aspects. And the first thing is to talk about Hodge theory. Yeah. 
And so now that we know that this homology group has this topological information, we can look at how it interacts with the holomorphic objects. So maybe the first thing I should have said is that uh, for surfaces, complex surfaces, there are, in fact, not just two classes, algebraic or non-algebraic. There's also a middle intermediate class, which is Kähler. So if you're algebraic, you're certainly Kähler. But if you're Kähler, you're not necessarily algebraic. And so the, the first thing that we need to know, it's a, it's a theorem of SU, is that uh, all K3s are Kähler. So I'll, I'll explain what Kähler geometry is. Well, uh, uh, Kähler metrics are uh, maybe, well, I would, I would say in 15 minutes, but it's probably going to be uh, not in this lecture. Uh, uh, so, but, but for now, all that this means is that the following, it allows us to say the following. So H2 of Xc has a Hodge decomposition. So if you look at the cohomology with complex coefficients, you have a Hodge decomposition, which means that there's a way to split it canonically, depending on the complex structure, into these groups. And you have that HPQ is equal to HQP bar. And H30 is spanned by the class of the holomorphic uh, two-form. So omega, remember, this is the holomorphic two-form, uh, which is canonical. And on H02, uh, it's spanned by the complex conjugate. Okay, uh, and the, uh, all the interest in the geometry of K3 surfaces is to for, is to understand the relationship between these uh, two objects, so the Hodge decomposition and the integer structure. So why is uh, well, no. I, I, let's see. Uh, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah, because uh, the, by definition, so you know from the Hodge theorem that this space will be spanned by the holomorphic two forms. And it could be zero, it could be, I mean, you define it essentially by definition to be one. I mean, dimensional. No, I said it's one that doesn't vanish anywhere. And if there are two, their ratio would give you a holomorphic function on a compact manifold. Very good. No, it's a good question, but. Uh, it, it, maybe I should have emphasized, once you have one that doesn't vanish anywhere, there can be no other one, because it makes the bundle trivial. Okay. Uh, it's not. No, the, the, whole, no the, whole, the canonical bundle is trivial because it's trivialized by the holomorphic 2-4. It is true. Yeah. So a different way to say what I said in the definition is that the holomorphic, the canonical bundle is trivial. Okay. So uh, let me just make uh, one thing, one remark about the signature uh, of the metric. So there's a cup product, uh, which you can ask how does the cup product interact with this decomposition. And when you consider that on H20 plus H02, uh, it's going to be positive definite. And on uh, H11, uh, the signature is what it has to be, what's left over. It's going to be 1, 19. And you might recognize this signature as a signature that gives you hyperbolic space. So uh, when you have this Lorentzian signature, in fact, any automorphism of a K3 surface will act to preserve all this structure. So in particular, it will act on some hyperbolic space. And when it will, uh, you know, the isometries of hyperbolic space are of known, have a known classification, and we'll be interested in the translations. Uh, in hyperbolic three space. Okay, so uh, as I said, the, ma the main interest in the geometry of K3 surfaces is to try to understand how the lattices and the Hodge theory intersect, it, it, well, interact. And the main invariant, one of the key invariants, uh, is something called the Neron-Severi group. And 
it is defined at least. So one way to define it is to say that is the intersection of h11 with h2 of x z. So uh, we basically have this lattice, and when we complexify, we have an extra decomposition, and we try to intersect this kind of discrete object with one of these subspaces, which is of lower dimension. Okay, and uh, depending on uh, how big this, how big or how small this group is, you can tell uh, a lot about the geometry of the K3 surface. And um, so, for example, you can tell uh, just looking at the uh, neuron severity group whether the surface comes from a Kummer example or not, like the construction with a Torah. So, uh, again, probably, uh, so uh, remember I was saying that for now, from now on, curves will mean Riemann surfaces in, uh, inside this sur uh, K3 surface. And so uh, an important concept is that of minus two curves, which says that, so, which is the following. So if delta is in the non severity group of x, such that delta squared is equal to minus two, then uh, it turns out that one of plus or minus delta, uh, yeah, so one of plus or minus delta is represented by a, a curve C inside X, i.e the class of the curve. So this is the Poincaré dual of the, so you have a curve, it has a Poincaré dual class, uh, which is equal to plus or minus delta. And moreover, C is not necessarily uh, irreducible, so it could be several different components, but they have to meet in some pattern. And uh, C is going to be a union of the CI. CI is amorphic to P1. And C i squared is equal to minus two. So uh, anytime you see a vector, an integral vector which has square minus two, uh, it must be accounted for by this kind of Riemann surfaces that sit inside uh, and have self-intersection minus two. So uh, maybe I can ask a question to see. Uh, uh, so ju just from basic topology, how do you compute the self-intersection of a manifold with itself? So let's say you have this four manifold and you have this surface lying inside. How do you compute the self-intersection? Uh, A little bit, yeah. You wiggle it and you count, right? Like you count the yeah, and so, but, uh, so that, uh, that's how, what you do geometrically, but like if you have to compute, you know, some characteristic class or something of that sort. So what, what, what is the self-intersection of a curve? you have to take the normal bundle, right? And you have to compute the Euler number of that normal bundle. So you take an infinitesimal deformation, which is a vector field on your th thing, and you see how many zeros that infinitesimal deformation has. And uh, so th these curves in particular have this property that in fact they can be contracted. Uh, but the reason, why, so the reason why these curves are important, so let me just... Uh, Yeah, so I'm saying that the C is a union of P1s, which are arranged in some pattern. Each P1 has self-intersection minus two, but if I take their union, it also gives me a class, and I can consider its self-intersection, and it's also going to be minus two. And every such delta can be accounted for by such a configuration. This is why these are usually called the roots. So uh, let me just define the, the vial group. No, 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 it's not supposed to be obvious. Uh, I'm just trying to introduce some notation. I mean, proving all of this stuff would take uh, a, a long time, but it, it is, it, it's not hard, but it's not obvious. It requires a little bit more terminology than I've introduced. So it requires, for example, the Riemann rock theorem for K3 surfaces. Yes? Uh, so I'll, I'll, you will see in a moment why they're relevant. Uh, 
so th th they're relevant because there's something called the vial group. So you define the roots. So these are called the roots, the positive roots. And these are uh, the sets of deltas and, and s of x such that delta squared is equal to minus 2 and delta is equal to the class of a curve. C is an effective curve. In, in other words, the geometry of the K3 surface picks out, out of each of these deltas one of the signs, either delta or minus delta, and says it's this one that's represented by, uh, by the effective curve. And associated to such a thing, you have an S delta of x, which is just a reflection, as x plus, goes to x plus x times delta delta. So this is the inner product of x with delta, and this is delta. So this is an involution uh, which acts on uh, h11. Or in fact, you can make it act on all of h2. But the interesting part is going to be just actually with h11. And so remember, I was saying that h11 has signature 119. So we can think of it as a hyperbolic space. So we have h11, which has this signature. And so you can consider the light cone. And you can use, have the usual hyperbolic space. So I will draw the picture of this hyperboloid the way people usually draw hyperbolic space. So this is H19. And uh, so these deltas that have square minus 2, where are they located in this picture? In this one. Are they inside the cone, outside the cone, on the hyperboloid? They're outside, right? So uh, the co this cone is this vectors that have squ po positive square, right? And uh, outside is the vectors that have negative square. So the deltas are outside. But if you consider the, uh, so this is uh, the vectors which take product 0 with delta, right? So delta is somewhere here. But then there, it de determines a hyperplane, which is a geodesic subspace in this hyperbolic space. And by taking, so if you take, so here's delta. Taking the orthogonal complement of delta gives you a hyperplane here. And as delta is just a reflection in, these, in this hyperplane, it looks something like this. And uh, so this is what as, as delta does. And they have a bunch of these guys. And they generate a reflection group. So Wx is the group generated by the reflections in uh, delta and S delta for delta in the positive. Uh, OK, strictly speaking, you don't need to take, I mean, as delta or minus delta determine the same uh, reflection. And you, you, you'll have some thing like this. And uh, wh what's important for us is going to be the Kähler chamber. chamber. So this is a, a, a theorem due to Q that, so actually I'm not sure if it's due to Q or Yao. So I mean, I'll, I'll check the exact reference, but it's a fact maybe, uh, that the, uh, the scalar chamber, so, K, so the scalar chamber K of X, K of X is equal to the interior of uh, one, of the chambers associated to Wx. So inside this uh, whole positive cone, you have this reflection group acting. And uh, the Kähler, so what's the Kähler chamber? This is the same as the classes omega represented by Kähler forms. So uh, what Kähler forms are, I'll explain, as I said, in the next five minutes. But this will be uh, already uh, in the next lecture. 
But the thing that I wanted to emphasize is that there's, out of this huge symmetric pattern, there's a, pick, a chamber that's picked out, and it's the one that can be represented by these scalar forms. And this is, uh, in some sense, uh, you know, it, it relates a lot to the geometry of uh, the K3 surface, and I'll, I'll explain in which way in the next lecture. All right, so I'll stop here. <laughs>